We're talking with Ed Berger here on our series of what was the greatest music you ever heard in person. And uh, welcome, Ed. May I ask you to introduce yourself? Thanks, Lauren. Um, I am Ed Berger, and uh, I guess my professional association, I've only had one job, and it's been at the Rutgers Institute of Jazz Studies for, it'll be 40 years in August. 40 years? 40 years, yes, in various wow. capacities. And um, also I've done some writing on the side, uh, biographies most recently of uh, trumpeter Joe Wilder, and before that uh, bassist George de Vivier. And um, my main interest in jazz has been the career of Benny Carter, which I was very fortunate to be associated with um, as his road manager, photographer, discographer, all the ographies, and, uh, and also his, uh, did I mention road manager? I can't even remember now. It's been 30 seconds. You said road manager, but yes. you didn't say record producer. And rec you also yes, uh, he gave me you, the chance you, to, uh, to work with him on some recordings over the years. So that's uh, pretty much what I've been doing. Well, I guess Ed can't say it, but I'll say it, that uh, his biographies are among the best written of, of jazz artists, and this two-volume Benny Carter book, originally written with his father many years ago and then updated uh, several years back, uh, are thought to be uh, the definitive uh, combination of biography and discography and, and even a little bit broader, too, in cultural things, too. So it's a pleasure to have you. Ed, I'd like to ask you, like we're ask, asking the other folks in this series, kind of an impossible question, but one that uh, can at least spur spur something, and that is, if you had to pick the greatest musical performance that you heard, or the most memorable, what might it be? Well, my first inclination was to pick almost anything by Benny Carter, because I have a very personal, um, you know, feeling for Benny, and so every time I saw him, it was, <laughs> and just in reminiscing about him, every every memory I have of him playing is very uh, important to me. But um, I decided to pick the only occasion that I saw Louis Armstrong in person, um, which took place on his uh, birthday, or what everyone thought at the time was his birthday. It was July 4th, 1966, at a place called the Lambertville Music Circus in Lambertville, New Jersey. And Where is Lambertville, New Jersey? It's right across the Delaware River from New Hope, Pennsylvania. Oh. And it was a remarkable venue, which um, uh, they have a very good website devoted to the history of this place. If you just Google uh, Lambertville Music Circus, um, you will find a lot of photographs and lists of performers. But they were, just to briefly uh, give you the background, they were in existence from 1949 to 1970. And they had a whole range of music and pop, rock, jazz. They had comedians. Uh, everyone from Dick Gregory to Liberace uh, played there. <laughs> and in jazz, they had, you know, Basie, Brubeck, Ellington several times, uh, Stan Getz, Dizzy Gillespie, Hampton, Kenton, George Shearing, and Ella, who we saw that same summer uh, that I saw Louis Armstrong. What were you doing there? I mean, you were were you in college yet? Did did you go with your family? Um, I did, what brought you there? I did go with my family. I was seventeen at the time, and I had just graduated from high school, and I was already a budding jazz fan because of the influence of my father, who had a large record collection and a um, great interest in the music from you know the the mid thirties. And he was a huge Louis Armstrong fan, which I kind of inherited. And over the years, he began replacing his 78s with LPs, and he used to give me the 78s. So as a kid, I had a record player that would accommodate 78s in my room, and I would play these discs over and over. Um, and a large number of them were by Louis. Um, I remember the Hot Fives, of course, were, were his mainstays. Um, and along with a lot of Jelly Roll Morton and Bessie Smith. And in thinking back, I 
remember one recording that, you know, I played over and over again. It was Running Ragged by Joe Venuti. And it was also characterized by a uh, bassoon solo by Frankie Trumbauer. We should make a note, Louie's not on that record. No, no. This okay. was, this was, <laughs> this was a Joe Venuti led day. I think it was his Blue 4 or Blue 5 or something like that on OK. Mm. I remember the mm. label. But. So Louis got into your skin pretty early. And you actually, you know, it's funny. I mean, even though you probably didn't have a hi-fi uh, 78 setup back in those days. There's something about the sound of those records played on a 78 player, I think, that just never really comes across, no matter how well it's transferred, right? Yeah, I mean, I didn't have a state-of-the-art 78 player. I didn't have the right stylus or anything, but it sounded pretty good to me. I mean... <laughs> yeah. So what happened when you heard Lewis in person? What was the setting? Was this an outdoor place? Uh, it was a tent, and, uh, oh. I mean, I was already a huge Armstrong fan, so by 1966 I had seen him on television many times and was starting to collect albums myself, so I was really anticipating seeing him that night when the whole family made this short drive to Lambertville. And, uh, as I said, it was a tent with a revolving stage, and it wasn't really that big, so the audience was pretty close to the performers, and uh, um, I was also a budding photographer, so I brought along my trusty uh, all-manual Pentax uh, SLR that night, and the lighting was excellent. They had good stage lighting, so it was very successful from a photographic standpoint, not only musically. And um, I should mention that the band was Louis' all-stars of the time, which were Buster Bailey, Tyree Glenn, Marty Napoleon, uh, Danny Barcelona, and I think it was Buddy Catlett on bass, although I didn't get any photos of him, so I honestly don't remember, but I'm pretty sure it must have been him. And just in general, I, I just have to say it was an overwhelming experience because I had been idolizing uh, Armstrong's music for much of my then very young life and to see him standing there suddenly with this gleaming trumpet in the spotlight he just seemed mm. larger than life and, and just just visually it was uh, you know extremely moving for me Where were you sitting? We were sitting um, around I think it was like the 6th or 7th row back and as I said the stage was slowly revolving uh, the whole time so you could get a different perspective, you know, at some point you'd be behind the drums and you'd see Louie silhouetted in front of the audience on the other side of the tent. So it was uh, wow. visually quite interesting. What was the most, uh, well, you've dabbled on the trumpet. <laughs> dabbled uh, is very kind. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Uh, I don't... Stanley Crouch has written memorably about uh, his thoughts about the early days of Armstrong. He wasn't there either, but but he, just saying that you know that a lot of folks he spoke to who were around in the twenties said that the actual sound of his <laughs> trumpet was so different than the cornet that they had heard and the uh, other ways of people playing the instrument back in the twenties that actually some people actually passed out when they heard him the first time, <laughs> literally, because it was in such such a such a shock to the system. I mean, in a world in which we've been listening to people influenced by Armstrong now for 80, 90 years, it's hard to imagine a world in which that sound was new. Um, how did the sound strike you? Well, I agree with Stanley's description, of course, but um, I mean, obviously in 1966, Louis Armstrong was not new. And in fact, as our friend Ricky Riccardi has very eloquently laid out, I mean, he was the subject of a lot of criticism uh, from people that felt he had kind of forsaken his great talent and his position as, a, you know, the, the greatest jazz improviser up to that time and the man that invented the jazz solo and all the other cliches to become a vastly popular entertainer. But... Um, and he wasn't the Louis Armstrong of the 20s or the 30s. But as far as the sound itself go, goes, and that it was the single most memorable thing for me, 
I mean, his sound was unlike anything I had ever heard before. Um, I mean, I had recently heard other great trumpeters getting into jazz at that time. I had seen, around the same time, I saw Miles, Dizzy, Jonah Jones, and a little earlier even Red Allen. But it sounded like Louis Armstrong was playing an entirely different instrument. Um, he had a, well, I hate using the word, <laughs> a huge sound. That word has now been ruined for everyone. But, but uh, it was engulfing, I mean, and a Above all, it was, it was, how should I put it? I mean, it, it was very warm and, and direct. I mean, it just penetrated right to your soul. I mean, that's the only way I can put it. What was the show like? Was it, uh, I, I know in the earlier years, you know, there was a lot of comedy and, and dancing and cavorting around and really entertainment. I mean, kind of the opposite of Miles Davis in one way. Uh, what are, what are your memories about the show and the other musicians and their contributions? Um, to be honest, I don't remember specifically what they were playing um, because I was just so overwhelmed by the the whole um, event itself. But um, they were doing a lot of features for the members of the band. I mean, it was probably the regular repertoire of the time. Um, but... You know, a lot of the critics would say, uh, you know, they played the same thing every night. Well, I mean, I wasn't seeing them every night. This was my first and, unfortunately, my last night to see them. And the way they brought put the program over, whether they were repeating it or not, and they certainly must have been repeating it, the enjoyment and enthusiasm that they displayed uh, was just contagious. And... Uh, so it didn't matter to me whether they played the same damn thing every night or not. Um, and the other thing about, I mean, there was a lot of joking around, which I liked at the time, you know, and, and the audience liked it. Um, but when Louis put that horn to his lips, all of that stopped. I mean, he was dead serious and deep in concentration. And nobody could say this was not a serious artist, you know, when he was playing the trumpet, at the, uh, even that late. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. I was just thinking about, you know, you're hearing your dad gave you the 78. You're hearing Armstrong back in the 20s. Back in the 20s was when Louis was just starting. In fact, uh, the man who was known as the king of jazz was Paul Whiteman. Yes. <laughs> well, that, of course, brings up a side story to this whole thing. Because since it was uh, Louis, I guess you'd call it his putative birthday, I guess later it was discovered it wasn't his exact birthday, but at intermission they wheeled out a gigantic cake, and this very jovial kind of heavyset guy with a fedora came out and uh, serenaded Louis with uh, playing happy birthday on his violin. And that turned out to be Paul Whiteman, uh, who lived in the, that area around... New Hope, Lambertville. And, um, I mean, I, I knew the name. I didn't really know that much about him. But in light of what, you know, how much was written in later years about Paul Whiteman having, I guess you'd say, appropriated the title that people felt rightfully belonged to Armstrong, it was uh, something of an amusing revelation to see them embracing on stage some four decades later, the two kings of jazz, I guess you would say, <laughs> But, um, well, yeah, I mean, you know, to his credit, I mean, Whiteman did a, had a great band, did a lot of great music, and featured a lot of jazz at a very important time. He premiered Rhapsody in Blue, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that negative stuff is kind of like historical hindsight and really has nothing to do with him. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, I'm sure he didn't claim it for himself, but, um, but you could see there was great mutual affection between the two of them, you know, that... They uh, it wasn't just going through the motions. They looked they looked like they really were enjoying the, each other's company. And I should say something about the other band members. Um, I mean, they just you know conveyed such a joy of being there. Now, whether it was all put on or not, I can't believe that they were that good at acting. That you know, but they really seemed to enjoy playing, enjoy playing with Louie, and um, I think. One of the ones that made a big um, impression on me was Tyree Glenn. He was a natural showman and a great musician. And the way he and Lewis uh, interacted was, was magical. 
And I was also remembered distinctly the, the great dignity of Buster Bailey, um, who just was very impressive just looking at him and, of course, sounded uh, great, too. Uh, interesting that you know, the Buster Bailey had studied classical clarinet as a teenager with the same German teacher that Benny Goodman had right, studied with right. back in Chicago. And they were kind of like opposite, like... Uh, uh, Buster Bailey's great ambition seemed to have been to have played in a symphony orchestra, which he couldn't because they weren't hiring African American musicians. So he went into jazz, and uh, Goodman coming around to that stuff later. Now he he died not long after, so I think you caught one of his last gigs. Yeah, I think he. I'm not sure of the exact year, but it was it was pretty soon after. And uh, he now that you mention, it, I mean, he looked like he just came off the stage of a symphony orchestra. He was. You know, very dignified, and uh, um, also like like Lewis, whatever you know shenanigans were going on or whatever. Uh, as soon as he started to play, I mean, he was deadly serious and obviously dedicated to to what he was doing. Well, you Ed, Ed you mentioned in passing before that you bought your Pentax camera, and uh, hopefully, maybe we'll be able to put one of the photos up on our uh, on the website when we uh, published this interview you took some incredible photos <laughs> i mean i don't know how, you know you'll probably downplay them knowing you you'll say that they're not so good but i'll tell you uh, i've seen them and so have some other folks and uh, you got some wonderful shots of uh, of lewis uh, i guess really almost at the the end of of the stage of his career where where he still seemed very healthy and vibrant he looked he looked terrific and he sounded great yeah. and uh, Again, I just have to keep going back to the sound because as well as he was recorded, I mean, by that time, he certainly had re been beautifully recorded in the LP era on hi-fi and everything. And I particularly loved the DECA Louis Armstrong autobiography because he was revisiting, you know, some of his classics from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, but it was now recorded in, you know, really you could hear his sound. But even that paled to hearing him, to sitting, you know, like 20 feet maybe from his horn and hearing it come directly from him. It was just, it wasn't even captured in the, in the best studio recordings. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up here, you know, I know that when I ask folks to come up with their most memorable moment, I can only imagine that, you know, there are many, many others that were vying for, for place and... Uh, so as we conclude, could you share with us maybe what your runner-up was? Well, I think I will defer to Benny Carter for my runner-up because uh, the first time I heard Benny was at um, uh, Carnegie Hall in 1967, I think it was in March, when Jazz at the Philharmonic launched a tour of the U.S. and Canada. So, of course, I had been you know, worshiping Benny Carter, although I'd never met him at that point. Um, and he came out on stage for the first time standing there with Coleman Hawkins and Johnny Hodges. And that was just unforgettable. <laughs> I mean, it was um, just to see them standing together. Um, I was not that close as I was in uh, in the music circus, but... Even so, it was, and I did, I did sneak one picture in there, although it's not a very good one, but at least you can see the three of them together, and uh, uh, Carnegie Hall was a little more stringent about photography than uh, the Lambertville Music Circus was. All right, Ed, thanks a million. That was great. Thank you, Lauren.